So for this one, we're talking about at the Constitutional Convention, uh, which things they actually debated and why, uh, and how it sort of played out. Uh, some of these things aren't going to be exactly how they play out now, uh, as some of them have been amended and changed over the years, uh, but this is how they originally panned out, and most of them, that's, that's the way it still actually is. So um, we're not going to go over every single issue they debated, but we'll go over the main ones, which are going to look primarily at uh, what the legislature, the legislative branch should look like, Congress, uh, how it should be um, uh, distributed, and how representatives should be chosen. Uh, we're also gonna look at the um, powers of the president, uh, the formation of the executive branch itself, how it's gonna be elected, that's gonna be a very uh, difficult one to determine, um, as well as uh, what kind of powers they should have and uh, how long they should be able to serve. Um, and then we're also gonna talk about uh, the judicial branch a bit, uh, and the president too, uh, about how, of course, they're both chosen. Uh, but specifically for the judicial branch, um, we're going to discuss how they're uh, chosen and why, uh, because traditionally they had been linked with the king um, in English history, uh, and they did not like how that played out uh, normally. And then lastly, we'll talk about the changes they made to the amendment system so that this constitution could be changed uh, and modified uh, when issues arise or when circumstances change across time. Uh, and that's going to allow them a state pathway as well as a national government pathway so that neither can uh, uh, not have any say in, any, in, in amendments uh, or exert power over one another. All right, so this constitution, constitutional convention, let's not forget that two of the main goals here are, first of all, uh, they're going to want to increase national power. Increase national power. Uh, so that means, of course, they want the government to be able to, um, the central government anyway, the national government to have some say uh, over the actual um, states because that was a big issue in the in the uh, the Confederate uh, uh, Articles Confederation, which was a more Confederate form of government. Uh, and they also want to uh, maintain separation of powers. Maintain three separate branches, right? That's power. That's separation of powers. Um, doctrine, uh, going back to Montesquieu, and, and even before that, but Montesquieu is the one that really codified it. Uh, they really want to maintain that, and that's going to drive a lot of these arguments. Um, so first we'll look at um, arguments they had about the formation of the legislature. Now there was some initial resistance, of course, uh, to you know forming a new government, essentially, under the U.S. Constitution. A lot of people want to keep some things the way they were, and then they want to just revise the articles, but that, of course, is going to be um, rejected later on, and they're going to create a whole new set of government, or a whole new government with a whole, with a whole new constitution. Um, the formation of the legislature is going to change. Uh, it used to be the way that the Confederation Congress operated, that each state got one vote, essentially, uh, and it was equal. It didn't matter how big they were or how small they were. Uh, and a lot of the smaller states, obviously, are going to enjoy that perspective or that, that approach because... That allows them to have an equal say with the larger states that have more money and people or territory than them. Um, and that way, especially if it's a league of friendship or it, it goes beyond a league of friendship now to more of a, a federation uh, with a stronger national government, but there's still that strong sense of state identity. So they don't want you know larger states dictating all of their, um, all the national policies just because they have more representatives. Uh, so that's gonna be an issue. Uh, and this issue is gonna be really brought to um, the attention of others uh, when the Virginia plan is proposed. But I actually want to not start with that. I want to start with what it should look like. Um, initially, it was just a one-house legislature, but they're uh, going to opt for a, what's called a bicameral legislature, well, with two houses. So they're going to opt for a opt for a bicameral legislature, uh, which in this case means an upper and lower house. So instead of one group just making and deciding laws, there's going to be two groups uh, in this legislature that both contribute to making laws. So they can each, and we're going to learn this uh, in, in later uh, lectures, uh, which, which sorts of uh, laws and uh, propositions they can each originate and start, uh, but they're both going to have to approve of them, them essentially and pass these things uh, for them to go through. So, um, and they're used to this. Uh, they're uh, used to English history and they're used to a House of Commons as a lower house and a, and a, and a House of Lords. 
as an upper house. So they're going to kind of model that. Not They don't want the aristocracy and the clergy and, and the hereditary privilege in there at all, obviously. Uh, but they do want to have a, a sense of one house that is a bit more distinguished or intelligent or whatever uh, than the, the lower house. So um, they come up with, a, with two. The upper house is going to be referred to as the Senate. And again, we haven't talked about who is going to, um, or how these are going to be chosen yet, but uh, one will be the Senate and the other will be the House of Representatives. And this is how it is uh, currently laid out. And the idea was that, um, I'm going to, I'm going to, no, I'll keep it like that. Although it looks pretty ugly like that with, uh, with that being stretched. But nonetheless, I'll put an arrow over here. Here we go. Um, the Senate was the upper house, uh, and the, the House was supposed to be the lower house in this bicameral uh, sort of parliament, we're going to call it the Congress, obviously. Um, but the House of Representatives was, they wanted the regular people like to vote, like a direct democracy. So these would be chosen by the uh, people. And that was important because they really wanted uh, everyone to be involved. Of course, everyone back then meant property owning uh, white males generally, but that's going to change. And keep in mind too, by the way, I know that sounds racist and it is, uh, but even that was very radical for the time because there were no, um, certainly no major European powers that had that sort of freedom and access. So opening up even just to uh, uh, property owning white males was, was a major uh, radical change. Uh, England's not even gonna have anything close to that until uh, the Reform Bill of 1832. And even then it's not quite uh, this clear cut. So I, I realize, um, you know, in your head you're like, ah, uh, colonial racism, and yeah, fair enough it is, but uh, even that is a major step towards eventually including um, uh, non-whites, non-property owners, and uh, women too within the next 150 years or so. So it'll take a while, but it's a, it's a step in the right direction. And then they're going to use, by the way, a lot of the protections put in this constitution and in the amendments that follow um, as uh, reason, uh, to legal reason, uh, and constitutional reasons to open it up to, of course, non-property owners, uh, and then uh, minority groups, and then, of course, uh, women by 1919. And then the 1960s, they're going to ensure that all groups have the equal protection uh, to do that the Civil Rights Act. Uh, so it takes a while to do, but, but we do get there. So chosen by the people directly. And to have this more like uh, educated or sophisticated or distinguished upper house, the Senate was originally uh, intended to be chosen uh, also, um, they're trying to also from this House of Representatives. So originally the idea was people vote for the House, select the members, and then these members, whatever number they ended up being, uh, would choose the uh, members of the Senate. That's going to be ditched though um, for a a different solution, uh, which is also going to be ditched later. So what they agree on initially, and this is going to change in, um, I forget what year it was passed, it was the 17th Amendment where they uh, they changed the way it's selected. Uh, initially what they're going to do uh, to keep these two sort of separate to some degree is the Senate's going to be chosen by the state legislatures. Legislatures. Uh, that's a term that confuses a lot of students. Uh, state legislature, that just means it's like a state Congress. So we have a Congress, and that's what this is, um, where we vote for people who go to Congress and then they vote on, propose and vote on and pass laws. Uh, we do that in states too, but obviously the, the uh, jurisdiction uh, and the, the authority only is within the state border. So I'm in California, for example. So we have a California state legislature where we vote for representatives uh, or representatives are, uh, go to the Capitol and vote for uh, and make laws uh, in California only. So prior to the 17th Amendment, which is in the early 1900s, I remember exactly what year, during the Progressive Era, um, the Senate is chosen by those state legislatures. Uh, and that's going to be a problem uh, later. But initially, that's how they set it up. And they do that intentionally because they, uh, some of them do believe that the regular people are, are, are too dumb or uneducated. Uh, they don't all believe that. Um, that'll be a bigger issue with the presidential election. But uh, they do decide to have it state legislature initially. So that's how the two are going to be chosen. But the real issue, like I mentioned, was how we choose the number each state gets in each spot. So uh, this is going to be a, a, a debated issue when the Virginia plan, as it's known, is proposed, uh, which suggests that these houses should be filled proportionally. And that means they, they initially actually uh, said either by population or by uh, wealth. 
uh, as seen by the tax contributions of each state. Uh, but there are a lot of objections to that. Uh, first of all, if they don't collect taxes, they don't know uh, the wealth of each state. Uh, and you could uh, lie about the funds or pay. Uh, it's easier to lie about the amount of money being paid or provided uh, or available than it is the amount of people uh, due to censuses, census information. But anyways, uh, Virginia plan uh, proposed there was a lot of, of uh, terms here in the Virginia plan that extend beyond just this feature. We're only gonna focus on this feature of the proportion of uh, the, uh, or how these are chosen. So proportional representative selection. So what does that mean? That means um, that the amount of people each state get in the Senate and the House of Representatives uh, is directly uh, related to, or a result of how many people they have. Um, and that's gonna be the one that they, they choose to go with uh, forward when they, when they compromise on this later. But for a while, it's a big issue because naturally the states that support this are the uh, large states, large states support it. Uh, and those larger states would include back then, not now certainly, but back then that would mean like Virginia, obviously. Uh, what else? Massachusetts, even though it's quite small now, it was uh, large in population back then. That also included parts of Maine. Uh, Massachusetts, uh, what was the other one? Oh, Pennsylvania was another one. That was big at the time. Uh, those three states, for the most part, were, thought this was a great plan. The other states at the convention, though, uh, were not so happy about it, especially the smallest states. Uh, they very quickly reminded uh, the people that proposed this that this was intended to maintain the articles and just revise it. So the proponents of a, um, a plan that kept a fixed amount of, of uh, votes or representation per state, uh, that later became known as, or was known as the New Jersey plan uh, to keep Congress, oh, by the way, that's gonna be the name of this, that's gonna confuse some people, Congress, uh, is bicameral. So in Congress, we have the Senate and the House, and they both vote on and make laws uh, uh, to actually pass through uh, this body. But Congress, previously under the articles, uh, was unicameral, so it wasn't two, it was one House, uh, and they each state had an equal uh, amount of votes, didn't matter how big they were or rich they were. Uh, they wanted to keep that, keep Congress uh, as a fixed, equal number of reps. Uh, and they, the, the Virginia plan probably wouldn't have passed because there were only three out of potentially 13 states uh, that had to approve of this. So what they did was they actually were able to, cleverly for them, I suppose, um, but certainly not uh, humane, they thought of a way to attract some support from the south, the southern states, uh, which had uh, slaves. So they um, are going to propose a, uh, including slaves at towards this proportion of the population. Um, now that makes sense now, just like, duh, they're humans. But back then, they weren't considered humans, at least legally, they were considered property. That's gonna be, of course, uh, codified later by, by um, uh, later court decisions. But at this point, just realize they don't consider uh, black slaves or, or any form of slave uh, to be an actual citizen with, with rights. They are property. Um, so, by Virginia coming up with the idea of, of counting slaves towards your representative count, that's gonna really appeal to the southern states because uh, in some of the, the deep south states like the Carolinas and uh, Georgia, they actually had up to 40% of their population were, were slaves at the time. Um, that's gonna decline uh, over time as, as populations grow, but at the time that was a huge, huge um, proportion of their population. So. No one's going to agree to count them fully um, towards this um, proportion number. Uh, so they come up with what's called the three-fifths proposal, and eventually compromise because they agree to this, uh, where um, slaves count towards as three-fifths of a person again, essentially, as three-fifths a person or reps. So what does that mean? That means that now, uh, slave states just greatly increased the amount of representatives they could have in the House or the Senate. Uh, so that makes them really like the Virginia plan a lot more because they get more state power essentially. So their states have a lot more um, uh, power and leverage uh, in these national lawmaking bodies. So that 
definitely sounds good to them. And again, keep in mind, because it's hard to kind of imagine this, but because it's definitely not this way now. Uh, states back then had their own identity. Like you were a Virginian, you weren't an American, or you were you know, a Pennsylvanian, not necessarily an American. Okay, uh, so they proposed that, and then that's gonna, of course, garner the support of the southern states along with the large states. Uh, and that's gonna produce a sort of stalemate as far as how to actually form this. Uh, and it's actually a bigger deal than you think because uh, some of them were so upset about it, particularly small states, what do you mention, by the way? Small states included ones like Delaware, uh, New Jersey, obviously, Rhode Island. Um, they are going to, in fact, Delaware is going to say, uh, refuse uh, to go through with any plan that involves proportion. Uh, and that if they got rid of this uh, New Jersey plan idea where you kept a static amount uh, in, pro in favor of a proportional vote, they were just going to outright leave the convention and possibly uh, from the union. So it was a, a bigger issue than, it's, than it seems like. There was no way to really get past the stalemate. There were uh, too many states in both camp uh, that wanted one uh, way or the other. So Connecticut, it's initially kind of ignored, offers a compromise, but that's ultimately, ultimately what they're gonna go with, with. So Connecticut, Connecticut. Compromise idea. This is later gonna be known as the uh, Great Compromise. That's what I'm gonna refer to it as, by the way, but Connecticut's the one that proposed at least their, their delegates. Um, they proposed that uh, you find a middle ground. So what would the middle ground be? Well, to them, they decided that the Senate would be um, a fixed amount, just like the New Jersey plan. So every state would have the same amount of representatives. Uh, so for right, right now, uh, as of the uh, 17th Amendment anyway, we have two senators per state, doesn't matter how big the state is, and we vote for them, uh, not the state legislatures. But they're gonna keep the state legislature and they're gonna keep a fixed amount of senators. So it doesn't matter if you're a big state or a small state, <clears throat> you have the same amount of representatives. So the small states have some leverage. Uh, they gain some authority. But the House of Representatives is gonna be chosen by uh, proportion, essentially. So that's gonna give an advantage to the uh, larger states. So both groups, both camps, whether they're slave or large and they want a higher count or they are um, uh, smaller states or, or non-slave states, they're going to have uh, one option where they carry um, a degree of authority that uh, benefits them. So that's going to be enough to get them to compromise to where they, they lose a little of what they want, but they also gain a little of what they want, enough to agree to go forward. And it's worked out fairly well so far. So the great compromise uh, and the way that it's carried out now is the Senate as a fixed amount of equal reps per state. And that made the uh, smaller states happy, obviously. And then the uh, house uh, is proportional. So as you would uh, assume, the larger states have the most representatives. Um, so like right now, currently, it's uh, California and New York and Texas that have a lot more House members uh, than everybody. But what does it matter if you are uh, Montana, which is large in area and, and low in amount of people, uh, or Alaska, same thing, uh, or your California, Texas, or, or New York would have large populations and large land masses. In the Senate, they've all got two, uh, so it's equal. But in the House, you, of course, have more based on the population you have. And that's going to be enough to uh, settle this dispute. Uh, by the end of the, towards the end of the convention, and that's gonna allow them to, to draft this constitution without too much uh, quarrel over uh, the specifics of this legislature. One thing I wanna add though, because again, one of the uh, uh, primary goals here is to increase national power. They're going to add on, and this isn't part of the Virginia plan per se, but they're gonna add on what's called the supremacy clause, which officially and explicitly uh, states that the national government, the Congress, government uh, has uh, authority or if, if there's two states like the national government make the Congress makes a, a, a law and it conflicts with uh, a state law the state law is um, uh, defers to the to the national law so national government has more authority than state government uh, and that the national government is the supreme law of the land as it's worded I believe in the actual uh, Constitution so again, that just means that what Congress says goes. They're the, the national uh, lawmaking body. And if a state disagrees or has a law that disagrees, uh, that's too bad. The only objection they can make is if for some reason this national government's law actually violates constitutional rights uh, and they can pursue that through the uh, federal court system. 
But that's for another day and another time to talk about. Uh, that's essentially the compromises and decisions they came to uh, regarding the actual uh, legislative branch. Um, so that one, that one's definitely one to remember what the great compromise is uh, and how these uh, Senate and House uh, are each chosen. Uh, and keep in mind the one thing that does change later that we'll, we'll cover when we talk about uh, various amendments and, and the history of our Constitution. Um, the Senate's no longer chosen by state legislatures, the representative we have in the state. Uh, we just vote for them directly. Other than that, though, it's pretty much this uh, way still. So that's the formation of legislatures. Now let's talk about <clears throat> the executive, because uh, there was a fair amount of quarreling over the executive branch as well. Um, and you'll, you'll find out why we have uh, this odd system for electing the president that no other country anywhere else has. All right, <clears throat> so executive branch. Executive formation. So this was the biggest question mark. The Congress was uh, more clearly defined as what they wanted. They wanted a governing body. Uh, they pretty quickly decided to make it bicameral, and they argued primarily, uh, and they also wanted to have, of course, uh, supreme authority over the states. The only issue was really picking how uh, those uh, houses were represented. With the, with the president, though, almost nothing's clear cut. Is it one person, is it multiple? Uh, how are they chosen? How are they elected? Who elects them? Uh, and then how, what powers do they have? And uh, how long can they serve? Do they serve for life? Do they serve one term? Do they serve multiple terms? Uh, how long should that term be? There's a whole lot of questions uh, that they're um, gonna have to really mull over uh, throughout this uh, convention. So, some of the main issues. Uh, main issues. One thing they wanted to avoid was, uh, they want to avoid a tyrannical uh, monarch, right? They obviously fear that because that's the that's been the characterization of European and world history is uh, these emperors or kings or queens or princes or whoever they are, they have too much authority and then they abuse it over time and, and, and everyone suffers as a result. So they want to avoid that. They want no no nothing akin to a monarchy uh, whatsoever. Uh, but they also uh, but also uh, want to maintain the separation of powers doctrine, which you mentioned up here. So they're gonna to have to have some authority. They're gonna have to be able to do something. They should be at least uh, rivaling the authority of uh, the legislative branch. And then of course, they're gonna to have to determine their relationship with the judicial branch, which historically has been aligned with the, the king and the executive branch. They would basically pick the judges and pay them. So the judges were really just agents of the king or his officials in his court. So um, that's, the, that's gonna be the things they're trying to avoid. So the questions become, uh, uh, what form? And that, of course, means a single person or a group. Uh, the next question becomes uh, who, what powers, what authority they have. Um, then another one becomes uh, how can you remove one? Let's say one is becoming tyrannical or abusing their powers. How do you get rid of them? Um, and then like specifically, what are the grounds for removing and the process for removing? Uh, and then another, and they, again, they talk about more topics than these, but this is what we're gonna focus on. Um, and then uh, how to choose them, how to choose uh, and how they serve, like as far as the term. So how are they elected or chosen and, and then how long are they gonna serve and, and, and what are the details there? So that's a lot of things. And this one was probably talked about the most it's the most broad topic anyway, and it's the, le the least clearly defined at the, at the outset. But uh, it's gonna be, <clears throat> it's gonna dominate a lot of these discussions. So those are the four main questions. Um, it was actually fairly quickly answered this first one. Uh, they preferred a uh, single person for a couple reasons, and they called the president, called the president. And that's due to the fact that they did not want this executive branch to be slow, because Congress is gonna be slow because you have to propose things, debate, argue. They want the executive branch to be the one that can take action uh, more energetically and quickly. And they also don't want to have regional influences uh, conflicting with the decision-making. For example, if something needs to be, if something needs to happen, like uh, uh, 
some sort of, of, of executive order or law needs to be or, uh, or law needs to be enforced. They don't want groups uh, quibbling over you know uh, regional interests like uh, like say it's a, something that would harm the South. Uh, so any delegates in the South are going to slow up or delay any uh, response by the uh, executive branch that you might need, whether it's military action or some other form of uh, law and order enforcement. Um, and that way, uh, you don't really, if it's one person, they're much less likely to suffer from those sort of uh, uh, delays uh, and regional conflicts. So they kind of go with the one person, but again, the, the fear is they don't want another tyrannical monarch. All right. Uh, so. The next question, of course, becomes, uh, and of course they choose that to, uh, let me separate these questions, there we go. Um, they choose single person, and that's to uh, speed up slash energize decision making. Uh, and again, they don't want regional interests conflicting and slowing up any necessary uh, reactions uh, to things that are going on in or outside of the country. Uh, secondly, also, it's nicer to just have like a single representative that sort of embodies your government. Even if they don't have all the authority, uh, it's just easier to um, characterize a person uh, as a leader of a nation than uh, a group. Because you can, it's really hard to envision Congress uh, as the leaders because it's, it's, you know, it's hundreds of people, uh, depending on the, the um, uh, time you are at in U.S. history or the, uh, or the form of uh, legislative uh, assemblies you have across the world. It's hard to imagine that as a, as a thing you can talk to or interact with, but one person, you can. <clears throat> All right, so secondly, what authority are they gonna have? This becomes a delicate issue, because if they give them too much, they might be a monarch, but if they give them too little, then you don't have that separation of powers uh, where they are on par with the legislative branch. Because you can also have a runaway legislative branch. You've gotta have uh, the powers distributed somewhat equally. So uh, the main issue comes down to uh, should the president have veto power regarding uh, congressional laws. That was always an issue uh, in the history of the um, um, of England and Great Britain, for example, was what the king would veto and what he wouldn't veto, uh, and it was generally an absolute veto. So. If you have no veto, then the president pretty much has no authority. The, the legislative branch can kind of do whatever it wants. It doesn't have to pay attention to the, uh, uh, to the, the executive branch. Uh, they essentially have all the authority. But if you give them an absolute veto, so like anything that the Congress proposes, the president can just veto it outright and they, they can't do anything about it, then the president could completely control uh, the Congress and um, you know demand certain things uh, because otherwise he'll veto them. Uh, and that sort of makes the, uh, the, the, the legislative branch a, a, a subservient to the presidency. So uh, no veto equals uh, unequal power with the legislative branch. The legislative branch, legislative branch would have more. Uh, but if you have an absolute veto, uh, then uh, the president uh, controls uh, the legislative branch. Because they can essentially just you know hold hostage any decision making or lawmaking they have by, by vetoing things. All right, so they come up with an interesting concept that they currently are practicing. It's part of our checks and balances, which we'll, which we'll talk about more later uh, in the year. We talk about the Federalist Papers uh, and James Madison. But they make a key decision and compromise in the end, and that is it's kind of both. Well, it's not both. He does have a veto. Well, no, it is kind of both. He can veto the president, or she, you could, you could say, but it's only been he so far. Um, so the president can veto a, an act of Congress. If Congress makes a law, he can say no. But Congress can override the veto with a two-thirds majority vote, which is really hard to do in Congress. All right, so they might be able to squeak out a bill um, with a 51% uh, majority, and that would pass it. But if the president vetoes it, it's going to be really difficult to get two-thirds of Congress uh, to override that. Particularly now when we have like this, you know, dead split between Democrats and Republicans. It's really hard to get Democrats or Republicans to vote, you know, for positions on the other party. Uh, so a 66% uh, vote is, is difficult to get. So uh, there is a, uh, a veto can be overridden by two thirds Congress. So that's a nice middle ground that allows the president some uh, authority and power, but so that they, they're not just the, so that the Congress is just a lackey of the president, they can actually override it uh, if they're determined enough to do so. So, 
that's a that was that was a, a wonderful idea. Okay, next they are, are going to of course elaborate on how to remove a president if they are uh, acting as uh, some sort of tyrant or uh, violating the Constitution in some way. Uh, and this, by the way, is not limited just to presidents. It's for any official of the government. Uh, but we're going to talk about the president specifically uh, because that's the most famous use of this. Um, we've had multiple presidents impeached, most notably uh, recently Donald Trump. But as you know by now, I'm sure, impeachment doesn't mean you get removed. That just means uh, you put them on trial. And that's going to be the uh, mechanism they're going to install for um, removing a, a runaway president uh, or any official of the government that is uh, abusing their power or, or not acting constitutionally or being corrupt in some way. So they uh, establish a specific impeachment process. Uh, with uh, detailed qualifications for impeachment. So only certain crimes, alleged crimes, are, are impeachable. And as with any trial, it's only an alleged crime until it's proven. Uh, and then if they're convicted, then they could possibly be removed from office, uh, which has not happened. Nixon almost certainly would have been, which is why uh, in the 70s he booked it and then got pardoned by uh, the, the vice president who took his place, uh, Ford. But um, that is what the impeachment process is. So it spells out exactly which kind of crimes are impeachable for an official, even the president. Uh, and then it also establishes that to make sure there's no sort of uh, corrupt link between the president uh, and the judiciary uh, branch, which again was a fear of theirs, they made the Senate actually the ones that carry out the trial. Um, so. Uh, and the way it actually plays out now is the House, well, I've erased it, the House uh, determine if there's going to be an impeachment trial and the Senate carry out that trial. Uh, that's the way it operates now. And uh, technically, the person that conducts the trial and heads it uh, is the uh, Supreme uh, Court, uh, their uh, Chief Justice, the, the head of the Supreme Court, Supreme Court essentially. So uh, that's the impeachment process, and that's going to be, we'll, we'll put what it is nowadays, um, for the President anyway, the House would vote to initiate and the Senate actually uh, uh, determines uh, guilt or innocence. Uh, and that's the way it plays out. And again, if the Senate does find them guilty of the crime, uh, they could uh, they can they can punish them uh, by removing them or or some other sort of uh, of penalty. Um, so that's the way uh, the impeachment process works. So now they have a a specific set of um, limitations uh, and ways to uh, remove them, but also they've nicely given the president the amount of power that so they're relevant uh, in relation to the legislative branch, but they're also not lording over it uh, because they can have their veto overridden. Uh, lastly is, and I'm actually going to erase this to get this last one because it's the most complicated, is how to pick the president. And that is not an easy issue for them to um, agree upon. Uh, and after this, we'll go right into how they chose uh, Supreme Court uh, justices as well. So how to, how to select, how to select a president. And you might just think, just vote. And the question is, who's voting? Um, some people suggested a um, parliamentary system. Where, um, and in a parliamentary system, you could uh, vote for or choose a prime minister. In England, it's a little different. The monarch actually chooses somebody they think represents or can not control, but guide uh, the parliament. Uh, but uh, in some systems, they just vote for them directly. So in this case, the Congress would vote for the president themselves. Uh, but uh, people were uh, at the convention were opposed to this because of that separation of powers doctrine. They didn't want this president dependent on uh, or linked to uh, the legislative branch in any way. They didn't want them to be a pawn or even a member of the legislative branch. They want to be totally independent, somebody who has nothing to do with uh, either body. They, they, of course, could be former senators or House members, and a lot of them uh, in the past have been, but, uh, or governors or whoever. But um, they want them to be separate, so they don't want them to be dependent upon the votes of congressmen uh, to be voted in. Uh, they wanted a, a route that uh, was independent. So some suggested parliamentary system, uh, but uh, most 
opposed due to uh, separation of powers doctrine. They didn't want them to be a lackey of the, of the parliament. They didn't want to be connected. So they wanted an independent uh, executive. So they opted for an independent executive or independent executive. Uh, by the people. But there was a, uh, a, a hang up over this issue as well for a couple reasons. Uh, they opposed, well, the two primary reasons anyway, that they didn't want people uh, just, you know, voting for a popular sovereignty uh, or popular election, uh, just directly voting for the president because of, of first of all, some were concerned that uh, people were uh, either too stupid uh, or ignorant, or they would just, um, you know, vote in people that were representative of a, of a mob mentality, essentially. Um, and we've had presidents in the past that may reflect some of those fears. Uh, but most people didn't necessarily question the intelligence of the voters, per se, although some did. Uh, most were concerned with the logistics of it, because keep in mind, we didn't have uh, electronic communication or the internet or even things like telephones or radio, uh, everything that had to be, that was known about a person was received either by seeing it in person, which is almost impossible uh, for any presidential candidate to see, be seen by everybody and heard by everybody physically. Uh, and uh, if you want to know any other way, it was uh, indirectly through pamphlets or newspapers. So all you would know was what access you had to any newspapers or other forms of, uh, of paper communication uh, that could be uh, misleading or, or, or anachronistic in that they're like too late, uh, the, the news is no longer relevant. So that was the issue was um, uh, the logistics of the 18th century. Uh, it takes, it's very difficult to issue these elections and for people to even know who all the representatives are or the, uh, the uh, uh, prospective uh, candidates are uh, and have an informed vote. So it's not that they thought they were stupid, they just believed that they were, would be ignorant of the actual uh, uh, options. Uh, and that's simply due to the fact that it was the 18th century and people didn't have uh, access to that kind of information. They would have just been kind of guessing or picking whatever name they recognize, which by the way is largely how voters vote now anyway. Um, but that was an issue. And also another issue is of course collecting all of these votes and having them counted uh, in the 18th century. Very difficult to uh, uh, track them all down. Uh, first of all, communicate when it is, track them all down, transport them, uh, and then uh, of course count them. Very difficult to do all of that. So they opt for um, what they see as a, as a better alternative. So again, they, uh, um, they um, offer it by people, but uh, opposed direct election due to logistics of 18th century. Logistics basically just means like how you would actually carry things out. Uh, how you would plan it and, and run it and collect them and, and, and organize that essentially. All right, so what they choose instead is they opt for the, what's called the Electoral College eventually after um, some sincere debating. Uh, the Electoral College system uh, basically means electors elect the president, not the people uh, themselves. So kind of, like, kind of like how Congress works in that we vote for representatives to go make laws for us. The idea here is People vote by district by district for a, a single elector who would cast their vote uh, for the candidates. So they would hypothetically have a better understanding of the candidates and be able to, to uh, choose based on that. Um, so uh, districts um, elect a representative, called an elector, uh, to vote for presidents. Um, and of course, it's going to be a majority vote. Majority vote determines winner. And majority, by the way, means 51% or more. Majority, uh, if you've got three people and, and uh, you know, one, one person has 40% of the votes and the other two split have 30 each, there's no majority there. You have a plurality, which is the 40% they have the most. But to have a majority, it has to be 51%. So what they feared was, of course, uh, all these votes being cast and there's no majority winner. There's just like, a, oh, this guy's got 7%, this guy's got 30%, this guy's got 40%, and nobody has a majority. So what they do to try to fix this is they have them vote in blocks. So that means that whatever state, whatever your electors voted for in the state, uh, the winner 
of that state gets all of the votes, uh, which is how we have it now. That's what voting in blocks means. Uh, so majority vote uh, would determine the winner. So electors vote in state blocks as in a winner take all vote. So that means uh, whoever the electors select in a state, whoever has the most votes there, all of the elector votes, uh, or electoral votes as we call them, go to the single candidate. So you would win entire states uh, as one, and that's the way we've, we've played it out ever since. And that's resulted in a couple times the uh, actual election being won by uh, a president as far as popular votes, like more people voted for um, uh, Al Gore uh, than did Bush, and I think more people voted for, for Hillary Clinton than did uh, Donald Trump, but because of the um, Electoral College, the, uh, the way that it panned out with each state and how you a winner take all sort of state scenario, uh, the Electoral College had a, had a different winner uh, than the popular uh, election it did. So again, states just uh, broken into districts, each district has a, a, an elector, and they submit their votes, and then the majority in that, uh, or the highest amount, the person with the most support in that state gets all of those elector votes, um, and that is how they're determining who wins the presidency. And this has actually happened before, but if there is no majority still, even with that, the uh, House uh, votes for the uh, president to vote when no majority. Uh, and this is the weird system that we have that no one else has, and that's pretty much what we use now. So again, when you vote for the president, your vote isn't going towards uh, him or her being elected, actually. It's your vote goes to an elector and then in your district, and those electors vote based on uh, how that state was won. Uh, and then all of those votes, even if the, that elector of that district didn't vote in majority for that candidate, uh, they count towards that candidate. So. Um, if you're in a state that has 20 districts, and let's say, I don't know how many Nevada has, we'll say Nevada has 20, all right? They got 20 districts. Um, let's say 11 voted for, um, voted for uh, one candidate, Joe, and nine voted for the other candidate, Jane, even though almost half your state, or at least half the districts voted for Jane, because Joe got the majority there, all of those elector votes go to Joe uh, when they're counting them towards the actual uh, presidency. And that's the way it works. So you could, if, it's particularly difficult for what they call swing states, states that are very close as far as Democrats and Republicans go in number. So you're not sure which way all of the votes are going to go because they're very close. They're like, they're like this 11-9 situation. If even one other, um, uh, one district uh, flopped, that would immediately go from 9 for Joe, then 11 for Jane, that would mean all 20 votes would go to Jane in that case. That's what they call swing states, uh, where it's, it's very close uh, based on the population. Uh, and it's, it's a big deal, too. Um, and that's, that's how the Electoral College actually works, and that's how we elect our president. And um, they did initially design it so that the president uh, would not serve for life, as a couple of them had suggested. Um, or for um, a single seven-year term, but they serve four-year terms, four-year terms, uh, with an option for re-election. Initially, there was no cap put on it, but they put a cap on uh, the amount of times we elected uh, after FDR uh, was elected four consecutive times. Initially, they had the plan for, you can only be elected president once, and it's one seven-year term, and they did that so that there was no political involvement or you're hoping for re-election, so you only do certain things to help your chances of being re-elected. Uh, but uh, we've um, gone away from that and we have multiple terms now possible. So that's the presidency. All right, now we'll talk about how they choose the uh, judicial members, and then uh, real, real quickly we'll finish up with the amendment system. So, um, judicial appointments. So the... Uh, Terms that they want to establish, again, separation of powers is the idea here, branches. So we've talked about the legislative and executive branches, and we'll talk about them more later on with the specifics on like how to be elected and the age and all that uh, stuff, but right now we're talking about how they decided to and why they decided to choose the routes that they chose. 
judges and the judicial branch itself, they want it to be separate from the executive, uh, which is what it was usually attached to historically, because uh, they want separation of powers. So uh, that's going to be an important distinction to make. So they, uh, several things they're going to agree on. Number one, they're going to agree, agree to separation of power doctrine. So they don't want the executive branch being too closely linked, because that's historically what it's been in the past, at least with monarchs. Uh, they agree that the um, uh, judicial branch should uh, review constitutionality to some degree. That's going to be solidified later um, uh, under the uh, Federal Supreme Court of John Marshall, which we'll also get to later. Uh, they generally agree that should be roughly the role uh, as far as interpreting laws. Um, they also agreed too that they shouldn't seek out laws to, uh, to change or interpret. They should wait for laws to be presented to them. But they don't want justices being um, coaxed by the presidency or, or, or the legislature or other special interest group groups to go after particular laws. They essentially wait for laws to come up through the appeal system to them, uh, and then when they're presented to them, they would uh, make a decision on them. So they can't just like look at every law as it comes out and say, no, nope, no, nope, yes, yes. Uh, they have to wait for uh, the appeal system to bring it to their attention. Uh, I'll actually put that. Had to uh, wait for appeals to bring uh, review to attention. So again, even if, even if a justice is following the things that the president or the uh, Congress are doing, they can't just like hold a meeting and declare things uh, unconstitutional, uh, conventionally anyway. They have to wait for some court to appeal it uh, directly to them, and then they can uh, review it, essentially. So those are all roughly agreed upon. Agreed upon. What's not agreed upon, though, is how they should be selected. So since the concern here was separation of powers, uh, the executive branch had traditionally been appointed by and patronized, which means paid for, by uh, the executive. Oh, had traditionally appointed and patronized judicial branch. So any judges or members of the court um, in English history and, and other uh, civilizations throughout the world, they would be chosen by the king essentially, or the monarch, and then paid by them. So of course they're going to be siding with uh, the monarch as far as the interpreting and sentencing uh, of, of laws and crimes in favor of the monarch uh, almost across the board. So judges have been particularly corrupt throughout most of human history. Not that they aren't now, but they were more so corrupt or more clearly corrupt uh, back then. So to avoid this, they came up with the uh, idea that, and we'll talk more about like, you know, how members serve for, for life and why and all that when we talk about the articles next week. But for right now, uh, what I want to focus on is why they decided to split this executive judicial um, uh, merger beforehand. So instead of the executive branch appointing, they actually chose the Senate, part of the legislative branch, appoints judges. Or in case the Supreme Court justices. In case I didn't mention that, by the way, the judicial branch, the, high, the highest court, the single highest court, oh, that's also agreed upon, by the way, one single high court with ultimate authority is the Supreme Court of the United States. Uh, some people call it SCOTUS um, for the Supreme Court of the United States or POTUS, President of the United States, um, but uh, we'll just call it Supreme Court. That's going to be our uh, major court, but there's also lower federal courts uh, that they choose judges for, uh, but we're just talking about the Supreme Court for right now. So picking the members was normally a, an appointment by the monarch, uh, the executive branch, so they're going to actually flip that a bit, and the Senate is actually the one that appoints them officially. So the way it plays out now, the uh, president, the executive branch, does suggest them um, or, or proposes them but they are not the ones that get to actually give them the okay uh, or the denial. The Senate actually is the one that has to approve them, uh, and that's the way that it's panned out ever since. So again, agreed upon was the fact they want to keep them separate from the executive. They also want to be able to review constitutionality uh, and uh, that their decisions were guided by a review system, not just you know them choosing laws on their own, uh, as well as being a single court. But uh, the, the major debate became, of course, how they were chosen, uh, and it's ultimately going to be the Senate that approves uh, and appoints these justices 
which do uh, serve for life. And we'll talk more about the uh, judicial branch uh, next week and the weeks after uh, with the early court decision. So that's judicial appointments. All right, the last major topic we're going to talk about at this debate, not the, de uh, the debate, the Constitutional Convention, not this is the end of it because there's going to be a whole series of debates or prolonged debate uh, after this Constitution is drafted and the states are trying to ratify it. The last one's going to be the amendment system. The amendment system is, uh, is an important mechanism because to amend means to change. Um, it is a, it allows the Constitution, this is why people refer to the Constitution, the US Constitution, as a living document uh, because the amendment system allows you to actually uh, change it. Allows the, uh, allow, yeah, allows the US Constitution to be uh, amended. In other words, changed. Now, that's important because uh, you never know exactly what issues are going to arise as you write out this document. You, no one's a perfect social scientist. Sometimes you create these systems and ideas and you put them into practice and then they blow up in your face. Uh, so you've got to be able to fix things. Uh, and also, even if they are working initially, times do change. New technologies are invented. Uh, you know, wars and pandemics and all sorts of things occur. So you have to be able to make adjustments uh, for new scenarios that you didn't foresee. Uh, obviously not being set in the past. So there are a couple initial propositions, um, but the issue that's going to uh, really uh, slow things down that they're gonna have to compromise on was um, uh, people that were, that feared the national government just lording over the states completely, because so far we've talked about that's essentially what's going on. Um, they wanted there to be an option so the states could reach out and change the Constitution just in case the President or and or Supreme Court uh, and Congress were working together to just suppress the people uh, however they were doing it. So in order to do that, to allow a way for the national government to amend it, as well as the state government to amend it, uh, there's the states to amend it, they, they have two paths here. So, um, and again, one was proposed earlier and then uh, taken away and then added back later uh, to have both of these options. So initially, the way they had it set up was that two thirds of the uh, states requested a uh, national uh, convention uh, from Congress. So two thirds of the states' uh, uh, legislatures would basically petition to Congress uh, to form this convention. And then uh, when these conventions were formed, so national slash state convention basically another constitutional convention, uh, would require three quarters uh, approval to ratify amendment. So there's a difference here. Uh, proposing is saying we should change something or we should issue this change. Uh, ratify means we've agreed this is what it should be and three quarters of us have approved it. All right, so it's different. Proposing, which is what this section is here, propose, and this is ratify. Uh, proposing means, hey, we should change something. How about this? Ratify means, here's the changes we made. Now we're going to vote to actually put it into the actual Constitution and into practice. So this is how it was initially proposed. Um, but they are going to add an earlier proposal to this so that there's a uh, more clearly set uh, state route uh, that could be adopted and run. So what we have now is uh, two-thirds of Congress can, without the state's involvement, uh, propose an amendment. Uh, and also, and these can go either way, another option is three-quarters of state legislatures Um, can ratify the amendment. So I got a couple different options. Uh, either states can request it themselves, uh, two thirds of them, or Congress themselves can request it, propose it, uh, and then there's two ways to actually ratify. Two, th three quarters of the state legislatures, which again are people that are already voted in, sitting there at the state offices in the Capitol, uh, making laws for their states, 
or a uh, national convention of uh, state delegate delegates can come together and decide to ratify this, kind of like a constitutional convention. Uh, and it can go either way. Um, we've had um, almost all of our um, amendments have come through this route, and then uh, all but one have been approved this way. That's with all of them except for one of the 27. Uh, the 21st Amendment was actually this route here. And so far as I know, uh, this, this route has not been taken uh, yet before. Uh, but it's possible. And this is important because, key, there is a, a state and national uh, route to amend the Constitution. And uh, also, to make any uh, amendments, it, it is it's pretty difficult to get 75% of anybody to agree to something. Uh, so they're not easy to do. That's why we've only had 27. In fact, um, part of what we'll talk about for the next unit is about the, the Federalist debates and uh, the, the First Amendments that they proposed. They proposed 12 amendments right off the bat. Uh, that's what it required for many people to agree to ratify this, this uh, Constitution. Um, 12 of them. Uh, of the 12, only 10 were passed right away. One uh, was under consideration up until 1992, so it was there for over 200 years, uh, and the other one is, is still currently um, sitting there waiting for proposal because there's no time limit on this. Once you propose them and they're sitting there, then uh, they, they sit there te technically forever until they're outright rejected or they are uh, outright passed. But uh, that's important to know. So to propose is two-thirds of a state's request from Congress or two-thirds of Congress just initiates. Uh, and then to actually uh, form it and then add it to the Constitution, three quarters, three quarters of state legislatures uh, or three quarters of a state slash national convention, uh, constitutional convention can actually approve that. Uh, and that is um, how the amendment system was compromised. And that was, uh, all of these were important for making sure enough people in states agreed to um, a constitution that prevented um, the uh, tyrannical presence of a national government uh, and also maintain that separation of powers, which was really critical to a lot of people. But also, uh, while maintaining national authority over the states, there is some mechanism for states to affect change on their own.